Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Daviani Kamdar. I'm the executive director of the Palo Alto Institute. We bring you Palo Alto, the second annual Palo Alto International Film Festival. So thank you for coming today. This is um, a, a very special talk for me today because when we when I, we started the festival uh, last year and we thought thought to do the speaker series, we had to go out and find speakers, but we'd never done anything before. So getting speakers for an event that didn't exist. Um, was a difficult task. And John Gaeta, who's on our next panel, happened to be a friend of a friend of mine's in Marin. And after four or five sessions where I bought him drinks and begged, he finally agreed to do this, because he's so busy. He's doing amazing stuff, and he has a, a, a very, very busy calendar. And at first I said, you don't have to do anything. I'll just interview you. And he said, OK. Finally, he said, OK, I'll do it. And then he got interested. Well, OK, well, I want to do this. Well, I'm not going to do that. And John's name on our, on our list of participants helped me to get the rest of the speaker series going. And I think for any film festival of any size, our speaker series is one of the best. And I wanted to thank John before I do the proper introduction for helping me get it going. Thank you, John. <laughs> He had a, a million ideas for me, and I've only instituted a few of those, but I promised John I'm going to keep trying, and they're all good. So um, now we'll get on to the panel that you came here today, which um, John helped organize, and I'll introduce the four participants, and then we'll get them up here, and we can get going. Um, so John Gaeta uh, is an Academy Award winner for The Matrix. Uh, the Matri in addition to The Matrix trilogy, he's worked on Speed Racer and What Dreams May Come, among many other movies. He's currently designing a new film with the Wykowski brothers, uh, with whom he has collaborated, is a, has been a longtime collaborator. Um, he's working also on emerging experience technology with Float visual effects. And I've been to the Float offices in San Francisco, their studio, totally amazing. Uh, very cool stuff they're doing up there. Then next we have Habib Zagapur. And Habib was uh, nominated for an Oscar for visual effects in both Twister and The Perfect Storm and won two BAFTAs for those two films. He um, has been in film for 12 years and in gaming for nine years and is a founding member of the Visual Effects Society. He's currently a creative director at Microsoft Studios working on interactive games. Um, we also have Bill Desowitz. He's an independent film journalist and the owner of Immersed in Movies. It's a website focused on the confluence of digital technology and storytelling, pretty much what we do here. Um, he's also the author of James Bond Unmasked. It's available on Amazon, and it features uh, interviews with all six of the James Bond characters. Finally, we have Kim Libreri. He's visual effects supervisor at ILM, and he's worked with John on The Matrix and Speed Racer. Uh, he more recently was, has worked on Super 8 with J.J. Abrams and is now working on a forthcoming game that ILM is doing called Star Wars 1313. It's still too secret for me to tell you exactly what it is, though. <laughs> so well, with um, no further ado, we'll get the four of you up here. And I'm going to hand the mic over to Bill, who's going to be our moderator today. Oh, pardon? Oh, never mind. No, he has his own mic. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thought it would be a great opportunity to assess where we're at with uh, technology and storytelling and movies and where we might be headed. Um, there's been a lot lately about virtual production and its evolution and 3D and more recently as an offshoot of 3D uh, high frame rate. So I wanted to take a few moments to maybe assess where we are with, with all of this um, and how it relates to storytelling and um, go from there and see how it's going to evolve into other forms of storytelling and where, um, where we might be headed as far as movies go in theaters and at home. So John, can we begin with you? and? Uh, sure. Um, I suppose that uh, we, uh, one of the reasons why we thought it would be interesting to, to talk about this is that, uh, you know, uh, film is ever changing and uh, has done so for quite some time. 
and now uh, is a set to to change in sort of uh, new ways, uh, just opposed against all the other changes in technology in our lives, media in our lives. Um, you know, everything from the technology uh, that w uh, was uh, originally invented um, that gave birth to a new medium uh, in, the, in the beginning uh, to the way people use it. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not static. And um, so uh, it's a little bit of a big nut to try to, uh, to try to crack, to try to understand where you are at a given moment. But um, you know, one of the, one of the things that uh, you know sort of like drives us to uh, to talk about it, to try to we're interested in uh, a discussion, you know, with uh, with interested people, people who are uh, you know interested in film, interested in other media, just audience in general. Uh, we're we're interested in this discussion because we we want to understand where to take it, and we want to uh, be part of the the evolution of it. So um, hard to exactly put, a, put my finger on precisely, but we could say encapsulate in a very brief sort of history of it. This, also, this is like loops back to this festival last year. You know, the icon uh, of the galloping horse, Edward Mybridge, mm -hmm. camera invented to some degree, invented here in this area. Um, whatever it is about this area that uh, inspires, uh, but that for some reason innovation and the creation of new mediums in general seems to happen here, and it's happening here in great measure now more than it's ever. But Edward Mybridge uh, gave birth to this thing that allowed us to sort of have uh, the ability to uh, put moving images, uh, anything we want, imaginations, structural story, storytelling, all of these things seem to have uh, come forth from the invention of a, of a camera. And so, you know, in our careers, we, we kind of got in in visual effects, but all, all of us have a different story about what seemed to be a very new thing when we started not that long ago, mm -hmm. 15, 20 years ago, is already sort of a medium, uh, an aspect of the medium which is, seems old now. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, we're all sort of spoking off into different places. Uh, and I guess, you know, one could talk about is film the same? Is it changing? What, what is it today? And what, what are filmmakers who are driven and people who participated in film were driven by frontiers of different things? What are they doing now, and how are they being influenced by now? Can I toss it laterally? Sure. You want to say anything about it? Um, well, first thing I want to point out is that um, th we are being filmed. So I want everybody in the panel to look left, and now slowly look to the right. Yes. <laughs> uh, you, just, you just got scammed, because these are 3D cameras. So your, your face has been I was drinking just digitized. At the time. Uh, for eternity. Um, and this goes to one of the topics I think we're going to hit on, which is, you know, as technology evolves in, you know, being able to either take things in the real world and digitize it and view it differently. Uh, my background, having worked on films and visual effects and then delving into real time with games, um, I've, I've always kind of dabbled in where how do these two can overlap, you know, and is there a convergence? What does it mean? What's an interactive movie? All these different questions. But at the real heart of it, it boils down to the camera. And there's going to be a huge battle for the camera. It's a, it's a massive you know, battle to the death uh, of you know, tug of war. And, and really, when you boil it down, the difference between a film and a game is the camera. In a film, you're presented with somebody's view of a story. The, the director of photography, the director, show you what you want, what, what they want you to see. And in an interactive game, you experience it. Well, the ones that do it well, uh, or the ones that you feel immersed in, are usually first person. I feel 
Uh, and that's a whole other debate where how different you feel when it's third person and you're looking at yourself versus you seeing it from your own POV. And just thinking about this over the years, I've come across some interesting area where when you experience your real life, like your real life is first person, right? So it's really hard to do third person living, I think, unless you use mirrors or something. But basically, you experience life as in first person, and you go through certain experiences. And that's the story of things you experience. Let's say you experience some hardships or some difficult things that you've been through. Now, if you experience that in an interactive game, where you, in first person, view some experience, I contend that that is as close to or can be even more than what you experience in real life, uh, emotionally. And so it's as though you lived it, so to speak. And, and you could argue that's more impactful than somebody showing you their camera view of a story. Or you could take the opposite <laughs> view. <laughs> take the opposite stance. <laughs> uh, yet to be completely proven, because everybody argues, like, you know, interactive have uh, mastered certain emotions over others, you know, it's still, it's still hard to, you know, get emotionally, you know, in a state where you want to cry in a game unless you're the other kind of crying where you're frustrated. Uh, but, you know, there are games that have actually done that too. Uh, games like Ico, that, where you have emotional involvement. But certainly, films have been able to dominate that aspect of emotions, but they've had a hundred year head start. But now there's talk of being desensitized by the movies we see because of sensory overload. The, the need, the expectation of bigger and bigger thrills mm -hmm. may be taking precedence over those primal emotions that first um, took hold when we watched movies. And that there, was, there was always spectacle, there was always adventure. Um, mm -hmm. But there's talk about or lamenting that we've lost touch with that. So you think maybe in the gaming area, they're trying to fill that void, and then we're going to try and find our way back yeah. and build on that? There's an interesting parallel where you can argue that the biggest visual effects and spectacle don't give you necessarily the best story or, or film, right? It, the film can just be like com completely without spectacle, but be the most impactful emotionally. Uh, and you could say the same thing for, for games. For example, uh, I bring up the example of Pong and Minecraft. You know, these are games that don't are not spec, you know spectacular visuals. It's extremely simple, and yet people are completely immersed in those worlds and they feel a part of it. And you know, Minecraft, the characters are made of cubes. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can't get any more cruder than that. You know, eight by eight pixels. It, yeah. Of course, it makes me feel funny because. I've always been about pushing visuals and you know taking that to the limit, but I fully recognize. But there's something to be learned by that. that. That's oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. We're not, under no illusion that that's necessarily the key thing, but it can certainly enhance things. But you need to start with that foundation first of a good story. You know, I think one of the big challenges for you know cinema as we know it today, you know, a lot of people going into one central location to experience the same thing. It's as, as technology gets better and better um, in terms of what we can do in the home, I think that the experience of um, uh, watching a story be, is, is going to be very, very different at home because you can pause it, you can share things with your friends, you can interact with it. It's, we're only around the corner from you know, truly interactive media at home. You can't really do that in a normal theatric theatrical venue, you know, what are you going to do? Is everybody going to be on their iPad at the same time as watching the movie? I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. So I think that you're actually going to see a divergence mm -hmm. between what is considered to be classic, let's all take the family out and all watch this, you know, uh, passive piece of entertainment that we sit down and think versus how we experience entertainment at home. So I actually think that you're going to see a new type of movie for the home setting where you can delve much deeper, you can have companion apps that you're uh, that you're uh, finding about background story, you're sharing with your friends exactly what the what the story is on this, or even maybe even voting on what the outcome can be on a you know, on more episodic content. But I, th I really do think that people go to the classic cinema, cinema to, to have a little bit of escapism, and part of that is really to be shown things that you've never seen before. You know, there's a big movement now for high frame rate cinema. 
4K, stereo, there'll be all sorts of, you know, smell of vision people keep saying, there'll be all sorts of crazy things that happen, but it still really is going to be about that, how do you entertain multiple people in the same way at the same time? And I think the home experience is going to be very much a consume it at your rate and in the way that you want. So I think you're going to see, I don't think cinema as we know it is on a, um, a, a evolutionary path, the path that means it becomes extinct. I actually think it's going to contain it, so it's going to c continue as its own art form, but evolve in ways that are very different from the way we watch stuff at home. The theatrical experience, yes. though, how, how do you all see that going with the development of virtual production and, and the reintroduction of 3D? Take that. Um, well, I think that uh, just as graphed between these two points, um, you know, the camera, the theater, those are two things that are a dot connection. We, we, we sort of uh, have an idea of what a camera captures in a traditional film. Uh, human beings performing some story these days, you know, glitter or not with special effects, but there is encapsulated uh, this sort of uh, almost like a, a fixed sculpture when it's finished. As Kim was saying, it's a passive medium, the, that which we know film is today. And that's been with us for a while. Um, and the theater, again, also is a, is a, is a sort of a, 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 has been, you know, a place you're silent, you're contained. There's not a lot of interactivity of any sort. It's, it's, it's a very uh, sort of, um, you know, subdued, almost trance-like state that you enter if it's a powerful movie. Um, and uh, we were just t discussing this before, you know, regardless of the ability to deconstruct anything going on in any particular film that we watch, is like any other person in the yeah. audience, we're sort of disabled uh, mentally, <laughs> right, from thinking too much, from analyzing too much, and we're taken over uh, by uh, what is sort of a construction by an auteur, a storyteller, somebody, uh, a writer, um, in a fashion that we could never sort of self-construct necessarily ourselves. We couldn't necessarily rise to the occasion to create a brilliant work of art like uh, Alfred Hitchcock might, you know, or Stanley Kubrick or someone like that could create. We, we go there to to sort of like be impacted by something that a, a master, a genius storyteller could, could present to us. Um, so this has been the relationship for quite some time. And I think, again, even knowing all the things that we actually sort of, this group right here knows an awful lot about the technologies that are going to bend and break and sort of like change in pretty radical ways what people, how people interact with stories or other types of story-like media. There's just so much, and we can touch on it a little bit today. But it's still very, very different, right, than the sculpture, this sort of experience that film is. So the question is, is this a debate at all? Is there a, there is no debate, really. Is, is the idea of cinema, you know, fixed around this idea of sort of like this solemn experience that you have, you know, where it's very trance-like, one, dire one directionally in, no, no response, or is it going to, uh, is the definition of it going to expand? You guys are going to do a, you know, a, a talk about machinima later. There's all sorts of uh, emergent platforms and technology that allow for two-way interaction mm -hmm with story-like content. And that is well, going to have to allow for more to change. Well, we all have experienced the sheer thrill of being in a movie theater, whether it's a drama or a comedy, where you all feel um, at one with an audience, and, and, and you respond as an audience, not just as an individual one-on-one -on -one as well. Um, and it doesn't seem to be as much of that. Is there a way of reconnecting with that in a, in a pure storytelling sense? 
using the visuals in a, in the way we've known them, or no. is it a case of <laughs> no, I break, think, breaking it in, into no, I a different? I think every year there is always something that changes. I mean, like mo the most powerful <laughs> films have something that gets lodged into the into your memory and your you sort of like it may change the way you think forever, right? Something like decades will go by, and we'll still be referencing some small moment that sort of made it all the way through and and made some sort of impact on your perspective on something, right? And that is really um, never going to change, and I don't think that is diluted. Although all being you know sort of prior visual effects folks, we do work. We worked on lots of films that don't that sometimes miss, mm -hmm. miss that. The mm -hmm. spectacle sometimes is offered up. And there is definitely, we're in an era here where the spectacle part separate the ideas yes. part from the spectacle. The spectacle part doesn't resonate in the way that it used to. And uh, there is always going to be some unconsidered spectacle to come that will change your opinion of everything. Like, oh, well, Avatar came out and that felt like mm -hmm. a different experience. But I think that it's, you know, the discussion is the way you experience the, the film um, is what's going to change a lot. Or at least the, the options for the way you experience films in the future are going to change quite a bit. Um, because, you know, the, there are new theaters, right? We mm -hmm. call, in this town, we call them platforms, you know, new platforms. But there are lots of new theaters uh, emergent. Mm -hmm. And um, whether that is uh, the internet, whether that is uh, sort of interactive systems like game mm -hmm. control systems in your home, whether that is devices of all sorts that are, you know, connected and uh, allow for audiences, you know, the idea of audiences um, to be realized in a different way than in a dark room, you know, together. These theaters are changing radically. And I would also include augmented reality type of technologies to come um, and all of that. Um, but, you know, the thread line of a passive, powerful uh, story or uh, thing of that nature, that's not going to change. How that gets made, what the actual form is behind it, that's going to change a lot mm -hmm. over time. We've gone from mechanical yeah. film. Mm -hmm. Right now, yeah. it is now no longer oh, this emerging scary thing of a digital pipeline, HD, and all of that stuff. We're all doing it now. We can make a high resolution film with equipment at our homes. This is very this has gone past now, yeah. we accept this. There's 3D, there's 3D broadcast cameras in here. This is, no, this is not a big, becoming a big deal anymore. Somebody could be watching this talk right now with glasses and it could be spatial for them, right? We have worked on technologies across the last 15, 20 years that actually allow us to capture things where we could go beyond the glasses and actually move mm -hmm. around us mm -hmm. and all of these things. So there's the emergence of volumetric mm -hmm. methodologies that go along with a lot of other things that are happening in, in science and technology yeah. around here that are going to affect the filmmaking process and affect mm -hmm. the theater. Uh, you know, I think traditional linear storytelling will still exist for many years to come, probably forever, as long as humanity is around. But the way that we acquire the content that goes into that story can have a life beyond just you know two-dimensional images on a piece of film. They can be you know th as, as Habib was alluding to, you know, three-dimensional constructs that you know you want to re watch that um, performance of your, the actor that you really like from different angles. You can do that later on at home, your choice. Mm -hmm. You can stop the action. You can zoom in, almost uh, Blade Runner style. That kind of technology where you can you know look around a three-dimensional photograph and be the the sort of master of the composition is absolutely going to be possible. Real-time computer graphics is another disruptive piece of technology that will allow us to you know, make you know, Pixar. Im imagine in, in a few years to come, you make a movie like a Pixar animated movie, but all them pieces of content, all the characters, the environments, are just pieces of computer graphics that we can play back live at home 
on our video game consoles or you know, through the cloud or whatever, and be able to use, you know, the, the people who own the IP will be able to market the, the content either as toys, games, movies, television, all from the re original source media and original components. And we've never really had that ability to reuse stuff again and again and again in such a, in such a compelling way. So I think, that, I think that what we're going to find is that all stories start to have a transmedia component where the pieces that were acquired or filmed or animated or crafted are able to be reused in, in many, many, many venues. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think um, that's been one of the hindrances before is having to constantly regenerate things in each media. And, uh, you know, we're certainly reaching a point where that's no longer necessarily uh, holding anything back. And it goes back to the camera thing, mm -hmm. right? You could be watching a digital film passively, or if you want, you could take a controller and watch it from you know, some other character's point of view or you know, where you're participating. So um, it's going to make it more interesting for storytellers, and it's going to have challenges, because you know, the, you know, what are the rules you can and can't break? Um, but to your original question of uh, you know, what, what's going to happen with the theaters, I think um, we're probably going to see more and more enhancement to theaters. There's a lot of, uh, you know, we know like, things like IMAX have really made a statement because they definitely differentiate between what you can see at home. Uh, there's been uh, really interesting stuff uh, done at the Cannes Film Festival. Kanye West did the seven screen surround vision, you know, immersive. We've had Omnimax. We've had all these different ways of trying to, you know, we can have the audience feel more involved. And, and um, those are the ways that I think theaters are going to start differentiating themselves and have the experience be totally different. Because now you have high definition at home, and you have you know right. all these other freedoms. Yeah. So, um, you know the sound and image quality can be comparable, and you have plus you have the comforts of you know being in your home. But then there's another aspect to it, which is the social aspect. You know, you know like if you're going to see a comedy, you want to see it in a room full of people that are laughing with you. And so, you know, how do you bring that to the living room? And, and it's the opposite, the opposite problem. We had spoken last year about this ultimately becoming the holodeck um, type of experience. Um, what is that going to be? What is that going to mean eventually when you can step into that world and be a part of it, sit next to the characters, explore the environment more, you know, go, go rummaging? through desk drawers and things, and, and what is that going to mean as far as the, the storytelling experience and running up against maybe and, what the, the filmmakers... And, and you can sort of do that now. You know, my, I don't know if people are familiar, but my friends at Valve put out this thing called the Source Filmmaker uh, recently, and all their little promotional uh, animations that they do for their video game, um, I think the game's Team Fortress it's called, are all actual live components. They're all real-time computer graphics. So as a viewer, you can you know, play these things, pause them, move the camera around, you know, pick the shot that you like of your favorite character, and send that out for 3D printing if you wanted to. You know, the possibilities are amazing. You know, you actually sitting in the movie and being part of it, you know, maybe you know, there's a whole movement. Uh, VR is back and in fashion. Um, you know, you've got the Oculus glasses that are coming, and all sorts of manufacturers are trying to do the same thing, where you can you know, put on headsets and be immersed in that world. So I think that if we are able to you know, acquire the, 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 the scene that, is, uh, that goes into a movie or the content in an animated movie in a way that we can manipulate in post, um, post in somebody's house, then I think all sorts of possibilities. You and there's a choice there. So like you have, again, to, to me, it seems somewhat black and white, but there's a form of coexistence that can be had. There is, again, again you know, the auteur, the, the sculptor, the, the person uh, whom can create an experience narrative is the general mode. I mean, it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. that I can't create. I can't create that. I mean, I, I, sure, I could create something, but I, I want to see something that only David Fincher's imagination mm -hmm can burn. Um, and then you have everybody, all the rest of us, right? And 
So the question is, is, you know, I have experienced this thing, this universe that Fincher creates. Well, I've been so impacted, I want to step into it, but I don't want to disrupt his sculpture, right? Like, uh, me particularly, I'm not interested in mm -hmm. augmenting Fincher's sculpture. Mm -hmm. However, I, he has put all sorts of amazing objects of desire in this world. He's created these sort of fantasy worlds, all of this stuff, and I would like to step inside. I think, I'm not sure if folks are somewhat following some of the subtext of what we're talking about. These guys in particular have done some very uh, cutting edge, um, you know, um, cr you know uh, types of technologies that in two different ways, one, allow you to do things in game engines, for example, mm -hmm. that are cinema-like, right? Particularly like how you craft the perspective, how things are perhaps edited together and all of that stuff, but they've worked quite a bit in real time, right? Almost like procedural, algorithmic, <clears throat> intelligent. There's a lot of ways to put this. Also though, these guys have experimented on the absolute leading edge of acquiring the real world. So in some of the visual effects stuff that we've done, there are methodologies to not just put one camera with one lens upon one person and get a flat plane that is now projected and it's flat there, mm -hmm. right? There are now all these methods for getting people from uh, various angles such that you've acquired the whole thing volumetrically. When you connect the dots between things that are going on in computer graphics and gaming today and some of the amazing methodologies that they've come up with with looking at computer graphic like things, uh, games, animated pictures, whatever, and then you marry it to some of the things that have been done in terms of virtual acquisition of actors, real humans, and worlds, mm -hmm. <laughs> sets, and things like this. Put those two things together and look down the road five, ten years, and you will have this sort of new medium potential. It's a potential. Yeah. Will filmmakers go out and they will they go out and they make movies with this in mind, maybe, they may just basically have the equipment as standard, like now that HD mm -hmm. cameras, that's standard, <coughs> whatever, stick it in there, get the shots, yeah. multi-cams. Five years from now, there could be sensors and all sorts of stuff on a movie set. It's, a, it's, it's normal, mm -hmm. it's a normal practice, right? Will the movie be seen the way they always are seen? Yeah, there could be this 2D version that you see on the movie screen flat. There could be the 3D version, which we're seeing these things and have been around since the 50s, but they're getting great. There could be these new things where we can, okay, I saw the way that the cinematographer and the director intended, the sculpted, edited, with message, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I've seen that. Now, I'm, I want to immerse, I want to go inside, I want to walk around the backside, and I want to look around, and I want to learn more in an exposition. Hyper-exposition is, is a possibility in this strange marriage between cinema and gaming. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why, or, you know, this sort of this collection is sort of like, does it, are we uh, up here advocating, let's change movies because they're dull and kids don't like them anymore. No, we're not saying that. They're powerful. They're, they change people's lives sometimes mm -hmm. when, they're, when they're great. But, yes. You, yeah, I think some of the um, interesting things for me is, you know, here we are, you know, Palo Alto International Film Festival, and when I think of festival films, normally I don't think of giant spectacle visual effects shots. Uh, but in a really interesting parallel, if you extrapolate, we have technology now, currently, to generate any set completely believably in real time. Now, if you take a festival film, and you say, OK, this is entirely live action. They just shot it out in the streets. And, it, you know, and that's got its own merit. But at the same time, this technology, if you're shooting something completely on green screen, very soon, this technology could be accessible to not just people that have huge budgets, but people that may want to be doing festival films. Mm -hmm. And what's the irony is actually it's going to allow them to create things that they would never be able to afford, because they can just dial up a giant warehouse or dial up 
interior of a spaceship or whatever set they're trying to put their film in, it's going to give accessibility to more lower budget productions because right. of that virtual set. And so that's going to be what I'm interested in seeing is where the festival director is going to take that technology. Because we know, obviously, people that make the huge budget films can already afford that. Of course, it takes a really long time, and it's done in a way that we think is old fashioned. Yeah, yeah. But it's imminent that that's going to completely re revolutionize I, how things are made. I, and it's, I, I, I it's not to say how they're experienced. I agree. I think, actually, real time technology, when put in the hands of the uh, more artsy crowd in filmmaking, will sort of allow the spectacle that we can have in these high-end visual effects movies that we do right now, but with more of an artistic, sort of um, experimental um, uh, take on, on how you tell a story. And I think that the way to tell new types of stories within virtual worlds, with virtual characters and creatures, actually will evolve at the, at the, at the lower levels of the industry. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Because it will be accessible, it's cheap, it's, yeah. you, know, you just need a game console to render the stuff. So I, actually, I think you're right. I think it may actually sort of re-energize the whole industry. Given exactly. um, the way the culture is today with social media and post-MTV and the whole fragmentation, um, you could see different kinds of stories a along those lines um, where you're doing like, multiple things, mm -hmm. telling multiple mm -hmm. stories, multiple perspectives, the ultimate in non-linear mm -hmm. storytelling. Well, I, have to, I have to make a comment. Uh, what, what I'm finding interesting and ironic is the hindrance is not technology. It's people's mindsets. And markets. Like, it's unbelievable. Like, you know, there'll be some amazing new way to do something, but the social acceptance and people wanting to change is way harder. Mm -hmm. You know, and it'll be sitting right in front of them and they won't, you know, and that's, that to me is really interesting. If I'm, if, as an example, like let's say someone comes up with a camera that's this big and it does the job of the highest end camera that they use for motion picture, right? You can't use that on a set because socially, like, they're yeah. going to come and laugh at you. Like, what's yeah. this? <laughs> you know? so, so now, you know, like for example, the red camera, right? It's this big. But you know, luckily, by the time you put all the contraptions on it, then everybody's like, oh, OK, OK, it looks professional. <laughs> Now it looks big enough. All right, let's do this. Also, the, the melding of live action and animation is such that it, it's all becoming one. Yeah. And you have um, hyper-reality and photorealism on the one hand, and, and still a, a desire to do very graphic-looking things. Um, how do you see that? Playing out. I think the choice is whether you want your actors to be real or virtual. Because we're talking about virtual production here. You guys have seen Avatar, you've seen the behind the scenes, so you know where it's going. But basically, you know, the future is going to have a, a lot of green screen and a lot of motion capture. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so you, you, it's the director's choice to say, all right, you know, the set's virtual anyway. Now, is my movie going to need real people on a green screen? or do I want to do virtual characters? And I'm not, I don't mean like the director's just going to replicate humans. Uh, you know, it would be like a choice. Performance to capture. To say, I, I want my characters to look like yeah. robots, or I want them to be animals, or I want to, you know, that's going to determine what your actors are going to do. And people are going to eventually understand that the people performing these things are worthy of, you know, mm -hmm. acting recognition, <laughs> which is not currently the case. And, and so that's going to be a natural progression of that aspect of it. And, uh, you know, actually, we, and yeah. <laughs> actually, and one thing that uh, Kim had mentioned before is sort of uh, what's, what's kind of interesting is that uh, a lot of this technology, some of the technologies that we see that are mm -hmm. sort of pouring themselves into, into filmmaking are as accessible today to everybody, to all sorts of people. Uh, methods of motion capturing people and extracting people and mm -hmm. sleeving people with avatars and all of this stuff is actually being handed out in the last few years to pretty much everybody. He mentioned the, uh, the Valve mm -hmm. uh, engine. You, you can do just that right now with a, a Kinect sensor 
and the Valve engine, you can make something that looks like a fairly high quality animated picture right mm -hmm. off the bat. At home. What's, and yeah. what's, what's, the, what's <coughs> underneath that is the soul of the person being captured. And so what's interesting is that uh, we're going to see this, <laughs> this sort of race between indie future and high-end future with very similar methods. But in terms of the, the turnaround time, you'll actually see yeah. the indie futuristic stuff, even in short form, getting out there uh, amongst people and having influence. It's already happening. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I actually believe that um, consumer technology is moving way faster than high-end technology at this point. Like you look at, uh, you know, we're, we're beginning to explore what we can do with Kinect type devices in visual effects now. Yet, you know, there's how many of these things are there? 10 million, 20 million of them out there yeah. that people have in their homes. It's fastest and, selling. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's, it just shows hardware. you that the, the, the consumer's desire for new ways of, um, you know, playing games, seeing visuals is way, 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 has a way more critical mass than we could ever have in the high end of motion pictures. So I actually think that uh, in terms of entertainment for, for, is, uh, for, um, for filmmaking, for television, I think you're really going to see it sort of cross over where the consumer-led devices, you know, and it's still going to be incredibly creative people are going to be needed to wield this and tell a story, but I think you're going to see a, a reversal of the traditional model. The traditional model is all the innovation happens at the top end, and uh, because it you know, costs so much money to do this, and you know, that down at the bottom end it's really crude and primitive. I, I actually think you're going to see the opposite. I th and, 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 and movies, the way that we make them nowadays, are so expensive to make these big spectacle movies that, that people don't take risks. And I think that the new ideas will be tried out with this uh, sort of more accessible technology. And then the movie industry will, will, um, will uh, grab onto that. And in fact, you just, I was just looking at the trailer for, I guess it's the new paranormal uh, movie. Mm -hmm. And they're using Kinex as the, the, one of the ways that they see the ghosts. So. <laughs> Yeah, sure. exactly. It's like, you, you know, there's a mass consumer out there where you can amortize your, your technology, whereas if you look at just visual effects, it's not a huge market mm -hmm. if, it's, if you're talking about marketing. And so now with, you know, mobile devices, apps, you know, uh, all of these things in, being in people's hands, it's going to be new ways for people to experience it. And, uh, you know, I'm excited about um, Microsoft Smart Glass, where you could be experiencing a film or a game, but then all your peripheral devices can connect to the console and you can interact with it or do other things that you, you know, aren't possible now. And I think the new generation, you, you know, you, you, you all see the kids are just complete multitaskers. They can do seven things at the same time while they program your cell phone, you know. And so they're going to be, they don't have any problems watching something immersive or passive while they're looking something up about it at the same time or interacting with it or, oh, what's she wearing? Where's that from? Where can I buy it? You know, all of these things are going to be just like second nature for them because they're going to be grow growing up with it. Yeah, that's a little bit, um, <laughs> so like we went like a slightly, slightly medium, medium out there yeah. a second ago with volumetric stuff, but Habib just brought up something that's a little bit more like in front of our, <clears throat> our feet that's about to yeah. start happening. You mentioned the theater, again, the camera, the theater, the theater. We know we can we can lament all we want about whether the church of films, you know, the theater is going to stay as such. <laughs> Without doubt, someone's going to reinvent it slightly. Whether it's going to be like the most spectacular visual or sound experience that just I got to be there or something. There will be something. It will happen. But right now, it's not happening. Doug Trumbull talks a lot about it, etc. But. But yeah, can we have a high frame rate debate? The truth, <laughs> no. The truth, <laughs> the truth of the matter is, we all know though that the new theater is like the living room, yeah. and we know that like whether it's that screen getting bigger and bigger, event or or they invent uh, which they are working on, wallpaper that is no different than a high resolution monitor. So you got multi, you got your walls, and you blend out your walls. You have you've your, got an immersive. Your four, you can have your what your 4K 100 foot. It's an, you know, I call it a boom room, and basically you can then be immersed. And then that is not necessarily passive, it's two-way, mm -hmm. right? And you have also connected devices and all of that stuff. You, I still think that a movie, though, still is trance-like, and you will still have a hard time of multitasking, but there'll be other types of media that you will want to multitask. One thing also I think 
more about to take off, and that is, I, you know, in the past, you know, independent filmmakers have come up and said, well, what, you know, I make films, right? I, I just make films, right? And that, I, I don't do interactive, I'm not very super teched out, I'm not involved in the scene. And so how is it that my film fits into this culture of interactivity and device obsession? And um, there's, for example, simple things, I think, which will create depth in film, not dimensionally, but mm -hmm. intellectually, in so far as, for example, uh, analytics, right, or Google goggles, and I can point my phone at anything, and they will determine, you know, Google will determine, oh, I know what that painting is, I know what that, that can of Coke is, I know this or that, right? So object recognition, intelligence in understanding elements, et cetera, that might be in a frame. So any given movie or TV show or passive something, every element in that frame across time could be a hyperlink to something, mm -hmm. whether that's curated or aggregated. And at the same time, with audiences that may you know, care to talk about or be influenced by across, you know, you know, and there'll be like heat maps of people's engagement mm -hmm. that will be available. They'll be, in a, you know, and watching the, passive things with your friends. There's all sorts of stuff. Yeah, and that's been done with the Hills TV show. People watch live on the web and they can tag comments on people's clothes mm -hmm. and make, you know, notes and then everybody votes on who made the snarkiest comment. Exactly. And you so can totally see that passive happening in films. Passive everything yeah. is about to become super rich and super deep. Yeah, because I think 80% of people that watch TV at home do it with their laptop on. Yeah. Right. Was the, the statistics that the TV folks found, and then it was like, oh my god, we, but we can't beat them, we gotta join them. <laughs> I mean, everything is, everything is being metricized now, anyhow, right? So every, any word that's spoken in a movie could be a hyperlink. Every face that flies past, you know, every location, if you have interest. Now, I think, again, first time through, unless it's super dull and you're, you, you're, too, you're too jittery, first time through, I think people will probably experience films the way they, they kind of have to. They're, they have their brains deactivated. But I am sure that there'll be like many, many, many opportunities where people can sort of like delve into, mm -hmm. I want to know everything about what's going on in this yeah. frame. Do you, from, do you, do yeah. you think there's going to be a moment in time where you go and watch a movie, as soon as you leave the theater on your iPad, you're able to watch the movie again and revisit and go deeper into the content. You know, I know there's this whole you know, fear of piracy and what it means that if the movie is available as an online format the, you know, the day that the thing releases in theaters. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that the modern generations, as soon as they've left that movie theater, they want to be able to watch it again, look at the things that they liked. And I, I think that uh, it's going to sort of change the way that people think about distribution. Um, any, well, any ideas? What, one possibility is you go to see the movie in the movie theater. Like, well, let's take Star Wars as an example. You go to see that first episode, mm -hmm. and what if you had already laid all the other episodes out, and then you go home and you can experience the other episodes, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like a serial, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or in a transmedia yeah. way, um, mm -hmm. you open up that world into several other possibilities that have already been made available to you. So you go to see that one theatrical experience, and it's really just that's when that is yeah. that's what's being built, like yeah. with without unless you follow these things mm -hmm. in the blogs, and you're you're participating because you work at one of these amazing tech codes or whatever. But there is like a big, big, big new medium being engineered right now, the reinvention of television. I suppose you could call it television. Mm -hmm. But just that, right, yeah. is going to become the new, like the, all things will be connected. Anything that's related <coughs> will be accessible to you easily, portal through. One can start it. One, there's a catalyst. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, the catalyst for filmmaking. Well, will still be, right? That mm -hmm. sort of solemn experience in the yeah. theater or whatever. But it can be a lot more like uh, experiencing Memento, you know, Chris Nolan's Memento, where you you experience snippets of your choosing, 
and it's not necessarily chronological order, and you have to make sense of it. Or, or inception. Or, you know, we pick, were talking about inception. Or pick a character. No. Uh, let's say you like a certain character in the movie. You know, I want to know more about Boba, Boba Fett and where he came from. So you get his background or any, any, anything. All the backstories that the filmmaker doesn't have time to show you in that time slot, they could be woven into it. Which they have always lamented, right? It's about never having enough time on the screen yeah. for exposition of the world, of the universe, and all these backstories. But, and, then, and, then, and, and then, you know, the last 10, 20 years, they're like, OK, well, we'll make a game. We'll spin out a game. Here's a web. Here's a coffee table book. I got a website over here that explains some stuff. I got some fans who are so obsessed they made up their fake hierarchy of, you know, people that, you know, are peripherally connected. Game of Thrones, right? It's got all this lineage. It's like, where are the families? All this stuff, right? Like a fake history. And this is where the very new, seemingly, again, the game industry, like the visual effects industry, it's a new old industry. It's an old yeah. new industry. It's, but it's made a major impact insofar as like people would like you know that kind of expository underpinning and in, and immersive exten extensions, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think I think you want to get people to theaters, you make their ticket, the theatrical ticket, unlock the deep content. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then straight away that people are gonna okay, you have to go to the theater if you want to be part of this. It's the gateway yeah. to everything else. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and another controversial thing that'll come up in, in the near future is the you know, the authorship, so how does user-generated content and mass calling of people contributing stuff, to your point, like creating the story, you know, that's a really interesting debate for me because one could argue that that's usually no good. You need, you need the vision of the one director and, you know, establishing something. And we talked about this a few weeks ago at the 5D conference. It was like, you know, generally speaking, that doesn't work out, but there's cases where it does, you know? And, you know, we brought up the example of Minecraft. I mean, you know, there's people spending a lot of time in this universe building stuff and experiencing things that happen, and then the next day they're telling these stories to their friends, and there's entire YouTube TV channels dedicated to people experiencing these things, and then people watch that. And it's just something that just generates its, itself. I think maybe it's a good time to open it up to questions <laughs> from the audience. <laughs> You know, someone that has a microphone here. I have to think that the, the will theaters go away question is kind of parallel to will books go away and, mm -hmm. and different in other ways. But there's something, you don't take a date to your living room in mm -hmm. the same way that you take a date out. Mm -hmm. You don't take your, your friends or your birthday party, you know, there's something about the social and mm -hmm. getting out of the house aspect that won't go away, I have to think. Um, comments? Yeah, I agree, but I think that, uh, I totally agree. Um, if I was 16, again, I guess I would be able to better answer that question, right? Do I right. want, you know, what do I, yeah. what compels each new generation, right? What, what's drawing them out of the home? They're still drawn out of the home. They're not, it's, you know, people, Yes, there's everybody, not just kids, but it's like an addiction, right? People are just touching their phones and communicating and like not talking and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's true that that's happening, but that it could be like, it's still like a, a, a snapshot in time, right? It doesn't mean that these things will be slightly reinvented and compel people to come, but people should think about that. You know, people should think about, there is a lot going on now. Another thing that's going on, this is sort of a cousin of this, there's quite a lot going on with like experiencing things on location now with media, right? There's lots of interactive media going on. You can go, you know, be it cultural or retail and try to interact and touch things or whatever it is to try to draw people and have them have an experience in a social space. It's media-like, you know, but it's not in your living room. And that is exploding. There's a lot going on there in, in sort of the experience category. And so I think that's going to rise. And whether it's a movie per se in a theater or something else, because interactivity is more important, but I'm still with somebody, you know, and doing, I think that that'll still. Yeah, it's, it's more the analogy of maybe, you know, what I foresee is films may go in theaters may become what opera is today, 
or live action theater, because that's what, that was the entertainment before. And then when film came, then they translated that into cinematography. And if you look at early movies, they're all filmed as though you're on stage. Everything's locked off and it's wide because that's how they viewed people on stage. It wasn't, it, it, yeah, it wasn't until later, it's like, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I can walk right up to the guy's face, you know, <laughs> or I can look at it from this way, you know. So they, then they started that whole language that came. And now you have, if you look at young people, you know, if you look at kids and how, what, how they like to spend their time, more often than not, they're going to want to be engaged in some kind of multiplayer game than to go out in a theater. And so, you know, it's a, it's, some kind of, it's a preference, right, of what they grow up with, how do they want to interact with their friends, they're still going to want to go out. And I, I just see the theaters becoming more closer to IMAX, where it's just over the top experience to outdo what's in the house. You know, you've got to layer in 3D and you name it. And I, so that's probably a, a balance. Maybe I've got a bit of an old school view on this, but I actually believe, you know, I'm a computer nerd at home. There's so many distractions. I'm a member of the academy. I get all my you know, Blu-rays and DVDs to watch. And I tell you this, it's really hard to watch a movie at home. There's too many distractions. Facebook's going off. The phone's going. People I am in me. I want to be in a place where I can actually watch a piece of linear narrative where, you know, like the, the layers of an onion skin, a story gets unraveled in front of me. And I actually think that's a part of human nature. People like to be told stories. And I think that there is always going to be a place where you can settle down and listen or see somebody tell you a really deep story where the payoff is at the end of the story. We could give kids coupons to try <laughs> it out. I, I, I think even kids, I think eventually kids will... <laughs> say, my, hey, you, this is different. You can see the same person saying that when they went from the <laughs> opera or the live theater to movies, right? They could make the same argument. Mm -hmm. But they're still passive. They're both yeah, the thing is, yeah. though, when we were young, we did that. Yeah. So we learned to love, appreciate, do it. It's part, it was part of our routines and stuff. And it's le it still happens with kids. They do do it. But it's less of their routine mixed with these other things. And so you, want, you wonder. Yeah, there was really interesting studies done where they MRI or they did some kind of uh, brain scans of somebody playing a game, and then people that are watching that game passively. And the difference is amazing. It's unbelievable. The person who's actually interacting is, their whole brain is lit up. And the passive person is just like a couple of spots. Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting, you know, when it comes to like how, how people stimulate their minds and what they're thinking. And, there's a whole series of uh, interesting studies done with that. Well, I venture to say, if you were going into a movie theater and watching a movie, your brain would be lit up more than if you were watching it at home, perhaps. Yes, that's a good argument, yeah. The more you're sensorily overloaded. Other questions? I, I love the idea of the theater ticket being the key to uh, unlocking the extended content. I think you should either patent that or open source that immediately. <laughs> um, do, do you think it's actually practical for every movie to have that ready to go when it opens? And, and uh, the other thing that's it's interesting to me is it seems like that's, that sort of thing is interesting because uh, it's, it's the, the filmmakers are reacting to the sudden demand and they're scrambling to keep up with it. And, and part of it is also generated by the audience itself. I think it's practical. You know, at the end of the day, the studios own the IP. They can control it whichever way they want. Um, the, the, the trouble that they're all struggling with right now is distribution. How do they get their content out to audiences? But in terms of the ownership of the deep content, they own it. They can unlock it whichever way they want. So I can see that being I a I think it's both. I think it's like there's two tracks. <laughs> it's curated and aggregated. You know, the franchise owners will curate because they like, yay, a destination where I can create all these spokes off of this one, you know, catalyst, yeah. right? But, you know, the whole creation of user-based, user you know, fan material, commentary, is as, is as addicting as actually the original stuff sometimes. Some people will just go, it's like reality TV, they'll just stay in that track because that's most fascinating to them. They like the social aspect. So I think curated, aggregated, mashed together, it is going to be an issue of whether the 
people who own the IP and the franchise, how much they want to blend it. But these days, they do want to do that because they know traffic increases from having both, really. So in the, uh, the traditional world, uh, when the uh, studios or even Microsoft, I suppose, are uh, thinking of their business model you know, for their production, They've uh, thought of the uh, theatrical exhibit window, the DVD window, uh, the airline uh, uh, window, and then the uh, TV syndicated window and all those things. So are you just describing how uh, the um, a set of experiences uh, that users have are diverging? You no longer have a single experience from going to a movie, but depending on the amount of interactivity mm -hmm. and, and all the other ways that you can, all the other paths that you can take through your property to experience your property, right? Mm -hmm. um, can you comment uh, from both the you know, industrial perspective and maybe the creative perspective, um, why, uh, how do you see these uh, windows uh, being replaced? You know, are, are they going to be like in a aggregation versus um, uh, the other one that John mentioned, the uh, experience? Or uh, is it going to be on the amount of uh, special features that you put in there, on the amount of uh, interactivity paths that you could have? Or is it in the uh, so-called platform itself? So it'd be great to know what uh, the business would look like 10 years from now. Thanks. Oh, 10. That's a tough one. Okay. Wow. Three years. <laughs> I guess. Uh, All the above, I think. Well, I think everything's going to collapse into here it is now <laughs> in all platforms but um, the only reason why they cordon it off into windows is because it, well you can look at that in the movie business right that the, the the shelf life of a film in a theater used to be a lot longer um, mm -hmm. and people would go if it was popular it would keep going but now it's very aggressive and yeah. collapsing and collapsing until they they realize that you know, the theater owners realize that they can replace, you know, that product with another film product in, in a pretty brief amount of time, and it's, it's about profit and all that stuff. So those windows are obviously getting smaller and smaller, and you're definitely hearing, like, rumblings of people thinking of doing, like, live simulcast premiere movies, mm -hmm. right, to people who want to pay premium amounts and actually see yeah. the movie, whether it's at their house or... Yes, and that's at been their done house, in particularly. Steven Soderbergh's um, bubble was released DVD and theater at the same time. So now that that, I mean, once the dam breaks on that, then it's really a choice. Like, they'll start experimenting, you know, with whether they want to hold windows for whether there's profit there. It's all about, yeah, it's all about whether the money is, 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 is there. If they feel like they could collapse that and not sort of segment it out, then you'll see things being available instantaneously, I think. Yeah, I guess it's going to bother Kim a lot. That's because, today, though. Yeah. That's not three years from now. Well, maybe it is three years from now, yeah. It's going to bother Kim a lot because it's going to go against the, hey, you're locked in a room and it's dark and that's all you can mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. It's doing the opposite where you, you, got, anyway, yeah. you got your tablet and your mobile phone and you got the screen and you got, you know, and then Obviously, the younger generation have no problem with that because they're growing up with it, you know, and we're still trying to figure out how to program VCRs or were, you know. And so uh, it, it's going to be lots of layers of uh, information and interaction that it'll just become second nature. So uh, a good, good example is uh, PVRs. You know, the, you can watch TV, but you can pause it or rewind it, you know. That's, that became kind of a huge capability, I thought, you know, where... Now you can actually like take a break if you really need to and come back. And so we just take that for granted, right? It, it may take you a little bit out of the experience because you don't have to sit mm -hmm. there and you, know, you can't go to the bathroom because you've got to like, watch it to the end. And so um, you know, live sports may be the only, the only place where that, that's still the case. But if you get used to these other things you can do, you know, you're watching a movie and something comes up and you can get some background on a particular character or you can figure out some other parts of the story, or maybe you're part of it. Maybe you can actually help unlock the mystery. You're watching Law and Order, and it's like, hey, here's some clues. You got to figure this out. The other, you're not going to see the ending, or, you know, if you don't figure it out, then it's a guilty vote or whatever. You know, the outcome's going to be. And so, that's 
going to be second nature to people. It'll be natural. There are there are some logistical issues here. It's you tough know, to make all this. Making by the a way. movie is really hard. Yeah, and then really, all this really other hard. stuff is a lot of work. So uh, yeah, yeah. And, and and quite often, <laughs> you know, it's different people making it. They're not. They don't yeah. stem from the same creative teams. People doing yeah. the DVD extras aren't the same as the yeah. filmmakers. People doing websites or toys or whatever. It's all different people that come together to make yeah. this unified IP. So the challenge that we have is that. Modern filmmaking, because of yeah. us nerdy computer people that have been working in the industry for a while, you can, you can design a character and finalize the look of a character in the last few weeks of production of a movie. So anybody who's making a toy of that character or any animated content that goes with that doesn't yeah. even know what that character looks like until game. a couple yeah. of weeks before we release the movie. Yeah. So it, or, or a game, and that's actually one of, the, one of the more dominant reasons that games and movies, when you try to do a day and date release game yeah. with the movie, the game is never that good. It's very, very rare that it's that good because the movie doesn't know what it is until you know, eight weeks before final release. Because games need more time than a film yeah. to, to be made properly. And typically, they get a fraction of the time even that the film had. Because they're already in production, and they're like, usually, and it's like, oh, yeah, we need a game. And then they toss the script over, and then the company has like less than a year, you know, yeah, nine months to make the game. Yeah, that's today land. We're like, yes. we're now we're chatting about today. That's and true. why it's dysfunctional. And so those things are going to get fixed. Like yeah. <laughs> film, but filmmakers, it's not like filmmakers yeah. are just, you know, there's a yeah. lot of creators that look at them as the beginning. This is the beginning. This is the big bang of this story, the big bang of this universe. Yeah. I'm completely, for a furious year or two, preoccupied with a sort of like the history of this universe and these people and all of that stuff. And it's really a moment to bottle yeah. and to sort of channel. And it's sort of like, it does sort of, imply that there is great opportunities by bringing in other media uh, creators to partner with absolutely and, at you know, that time i think for example games are in their infancy if you just look at the history it's only been a couple of decades and you look at what how much long film has had right now ex extrapolate that into a decade you, from now you mean video games video games thank you as opposed to chess <laughs> <laughs> yes interactive Video games. It isn't so, any video anymore. I know, it's a it's a passe word, but you know we're gonna get more mature about how we harness that and how we create those things, and you can just extrapolate that into what it can be, and so whenever there's new technologies, there's gonna be people that are against it. It's gonna upset some people. It's gonna you know flip things over upside down because now like creating things is different, or you don't know how to use it or experience it, and there's a lot of controversy. And then eventually, key creators figure out how to harness it and, and do amazing things with it. You know? And I think we're just about to see some things like that come up. Right? This, this, the whole sophistication now of world building, though, and if you do it all, build all those assets in advance, you can be on the same page. Yeah, if I, the, I think, if I, the creators are working together, right? I, I think there's a world. You know, I think the place that's going to see the disruption the most initially is going to be the animated content world. I think that you can build a video game, you can build the characters so that they walk and talk, deliver dialogue, you've got great sets, all for the game. And then you go in and you, take the, you make the linear content from within that virtual world. I think that we will see within the next five years some emergent IPs that are built that way. It was a game first, and they harvest the same content to actually make animated content. Or Team Fortress 2, as Team you Fortress pointed out, 2 is it's the, already yeah. started. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sorry? Right, but it's, it's, Resident it's, Resident no, it's but they don't make an no, animated, they no, don't use Those are the same. films that are created based off of a game. They're generally more successful because, as I said, it takes longer to make a game, and it's harder to make a game successful. What? So it's easier to take a successful game and say, all right, we're going to make a film based on that because you already made it, right? It's a lot harder to do the simultaneous thing, and it's a lot harder to do it the other way around. You know, we're talking about using the virtual world and the virtual characters that are in the game as the subjects of your cinematography. Mm -hmm. So you basically shoot a virtual movie inside the game. And yeah, I think there's going to be some amazing properties over the next few years. And all that stuff we said during these last two hours, just like smack that into one singular st sentence, what would you say? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Like, you can ask that one. <laughs> We've hit about 77 oh topics God. so far. <laughs> I guess prepare for change. Yeah, I guess I think so. <laughs> hey guys. Can you hear me? 
So you guys were talking about, um, you know, the essentially two things, you know, the evolution or reimagination of how this interactive content can affect, I think maybe a film's marketing, but then the other side of that too is how the evolution and innovation can actually affect the content itself, the actual film. How do you guys see, you know, um, this need for, especially what you guys were talking about, the passive engagement versus the interact, the engaged engagement, um, affecting the actual content? You know, you're starting to see some choose your adventure things start to kind of seep their way back into films. But I think the friction there, the way I see it is, at the end of the day, the most important people when it comes to the content are the creatives, are the writers. Is, how, how do we overcome that friction with, you know, this new technology that everyone wants to mess with, uh, you know, interactive or choose your adventure style n narrative, and then writers not wanting audiences to choose their narrative. Why yeah. do writers uh, want to write? Or, or directors for that matter. Yeah, exactly. No, we were, that's where we yeah. started. Yeah. It's a good place to, I mean, yeah. that's choose never, that's your never way going away, through. Yeah. Yeah is not really uh, the type of experience that we get with, with film yeah. and mm -hmm. cinema. Yeah. But the purest approach to that is visceral and exciting unto itself in a gaming sense. We, uh, piece the jury's out in terms of some story, but these things can coexist, as we were talking about before. They can coexist. Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh that kind of filmmaking, you know, single point of view, authored, you know, directed piece, that's not going away, right? That's always gonna be there, and people are gonna experience their emotions when they see it. Maybe the way they see it's gonna change, or the way it's created is gonna change, but that, you know, that format's gonna be there. And, you know, we always talk about, uh, you know, you've heard convergence of film and games, or, you know, a lot of things like that, and we think, you know, the film format's gonna stay, the game format's going to evolve. Maybe there's going to be a new format where these kind of things come together. And then, yes, the writers and the directors have to figure out how they're going to do that. And, and maybe it's going to be even more compelling. We don't know. But certainly what we do know is on the creating side, it certainly it has converged because we're using the same tools, same techniques, same very people. similar. And in many people. cases, the, the innovations yeah. have come from games and then put into films. You know, so that's, that part's neck and neck. And so, you know, the two formats are going to continue, but maybe there's going to be something. And then it's going to go into experiential, and then it's going to go into deep AR, and then it's going to go into <laughs> deep AR, VR, and then people are going to accidentally disrupt, uh, change their personalities, and then we're going to have a lot of problems because people are going to be acting out in fantasy-like ways. And, well, uh, uh, on that, on that, that note, on that note, maybe we should end. We can have that discussion next year. <laughs> on how it's going to change us psychologically. Okay. <laughs> thank okay. you all so much. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you. So, thank you, guys. Bill Deshowitz, John Gaeta, and Habib Zagapur, and Kim Liberary. Thank you guys for coming up here. We appreciate it. That was a great discussion. You might be able to corner them over here if you have some more questions, but before everybody gets up, I just want to remind you that the 3 o'clock panel is going to be um, about Machinima, and this is Variety's hosting the panel, Variety uh, TV, let's see the, get this right, um, TV editor. Mm -hmm. Andrew Wallenstein is going to be moderating, and the panelists include Alan Debovoz, I hope I pronounced that right, He's chairman and CEO, co-founder of Machinima, which is uh, the most popular channel on YouTube. And they're going to be talking about more than just Machinima. I also wanted to quickly mention, because it is so uh, much in alignment with what you just heard, the discussion you just heard, that at 4 o'clock at the Aquarius, we uh, uh, have Renga. Uh, actually, the two guys who created it are here in the audience. And Ranga is a, w one of these new kinds of entertainment that you've just been hearing all about. And we're really happy to have it here. Ranga is an interactive cinematic experience. The audience actually, using laser pointers, determines what happens on the screen. So it is a game in which the audience is all becomes one team. And they do battle in a Star Wars-like like game, and they walk out of the auditorium as a victorious team instead of the com independent individuals they walked in as. So if you want to experience something of what, uh, what's coming, that's happening at Ford Aquarius.
Okay, thank you.